Good evening, everybody. We have gathered together some of the top brains in the world on whether or not there should be patentability for inventions which are wholly made by AI. There may be some that are half and half. That causes yet other problems. And I'm going to give you my straight answer now. The answer is we undoubtedly should, because the big basic question is, is it good for innovation to have patents? And the answer down the years has always been yes. Jeremy Bentham told us that in 1792. And all the more so now because patents are not just ideas on a piece of paper. You have to develop them. And who will develop them if they haven't got the patent? So the answer ought to be yes, but whether it is or how you can arrive at the yes answer is going to be Decided, discussed by our brilliant panelists, and Gwillem, who is from the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys, and obviously will be in favor of anything to do with patenting, is going to chair it in a quite unbiased way. Over to you, Gwillem. Thank you so much, um, Sir Robin. I'm delighted to be able to chair it, which means I can watch fine minds without ever having to pretend I'm one myself, which I'm very happy about. Um, uh, I'm going to kick off in a moment by introducing the, the various uh, speakers. So we have a, a fantastic um, set of, of panellists here, um, and uh, i just go through them very quickly. Um, everyone very kindly has passed me their introductions, and then going through our, our speakers in order of um, uh, presentation. Um, we have Nikki Curtis, uh, who works as a patent policy advisor at the UK IPO, um, and in particular looks at uh, specific technology issues uh, for the UK domestic uh, patent framework. Um, we have uh, Professor Ryan Abbott, um, I suspect also doesn't need a lot of introduction, um, and has caused all this mayhem. Um, thank you, thank you, Ryan. Um, no, has, has actually done a fantastic job of making this a big issue very early on in the life of AI through his work with um, Dabus, which is uh, obviously a very high profile uh, case that, that, that uh, we're going to be discussing. I think it does provide quite a good framework for today's discussion. Uh, he is a professor of law and health sciences at University of uh, Surrey, graduated uh, San Diego School of Medicine, and uh, is, is multiply um, qualified. I will mention his excellent book, The Reasonable Robot. I loved reading that. Um, it's brilliant because it goes way beyond patent law, which is what, frankly, I'm, I, all I know about, to some other really interesting elements of, 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 of law where the same issues arise. What is the impact of the introduction and advent of AI? Uh, I do commend it to everybody. Ryan, I always give you a plug, as you know, um, but it's, it's well-deserved. Um, then uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Karina Brink, who's a partner at Zacco, uh, patent attorney, um, very active with the CEPA's Computer Technology Committee, and we'll be talking about what, what the UK Institute has been uh, saying and, and trying to agree on. Um, even we can't quite come to the, a single conclusion, so uh, I've seen Karina's presentation, that's very interesting. Uh, to see as well. Um, I should also mention the PhD in space physics because, I mean, you've got to mention the PhD in space physics. That's awesome. Um, and uh, delighted also uh, to uh, invite our most intrepid, well, we actually, we, have, we, we, we are crossing quite a few time zones. I think, Ryan, you're in um, LA, I believe. Um, uh, the, the, um, the Honourable Justice Jonathan Beach joins us from Australia, and we think we may be able to watch sunrise through the window there during this session, which is also really, really exciting. So um, uh, Justice Beach um, was appointed to the Federal Court of Australia in 2014. Uh, he has uh, an LLB, a BSc in Physical Chemistry, and not irrelevantly, an MA in uh, Philosophy. And um, at the moment, there are elements of philosophy about this debate as well. So hopefully we'll be able to bring a bit of that in as well. Um, he uh, has been a QC since 1999 and comes from a family of judges, which is <laughs> particularly impressive. Um, and I'm sure I won't be the first person to refer to them as the Beach Boys, and I'm sorry for that, but it, it, did, it did spring to mind. Um, and also rather relevantly has been involved in the Dabu's case in Australia as well. So we'll definitely be able to bring some insights there. Um, uh, so Robin has introduced and 
brought some of the main considerations to us already and we know that it's a hot topic basically all around the world um, and hopefully we can have a good discussion about it here starting um, with uh, Nikki if that's okay who's going to be giving us kind of setting the scene and telling us what the UK government view has been up to now. Okay thanks Gwilym and uh, good evening all. Um, I'm going to start the, uh, the panel presentations today by setting out what the UK government is doing in the area of AI and inventorship. Uh, Lisa, can the next slide, please? OK, so some of you will remember that last year, the um, UK Intellectual Property Office um, ran a call for views on AI and IP more generally, looking to see if the IP framework is fit for purpose. Um, and in the area of patents, we asked a specific question about whether there's a case uh, for patent law to protect AI devised in inventions. And uh, we all realized that, that, um, that uh, the main reason for that was the fact that Dr. Thaler had filed patent applications in which um, he'd uh, named AI system Davis as the inventor. Um, and the law then, as it has been confirmed the court, by the Court of Appeal since, is that UK patent applicants must name a human inventor or inventors. Um, also, the Court of Appeal noted that the applicant was not able to show any law that would give him ownership um, of any patent. Um, so although we talk about this thing in terms of um, inventorship, actually the sort of the conversation is about um, uh, inventorship and entitlement because the two sort of go hand in hand. Next slide, please, Lisa. So in terms of what was said in, in those call for views, well, we certainly have mixed views on the question, can um, AI systems devise inventions? Um, there were some that said um, AI um, would not qualify as inventor now, and they couldn't even see it in the, the future. Um, so therefore, in their view, sort of the current patent system was, was adequate, was satisfactory. But there were other concerns expressed that the absence of patents for AI device invention could have damaging impacts, um, particularly on investment in building and owning and using AI. Um, and as we all know, um, investment decisions are very much made um, upstream of any inventions that eventually arise. So if there's any question about whether those inventions are sort of derived from um, a human or an, an AI system, that could actually sort of have a dampening effect. Um, there was also comments made about um, if patents weren't available, that trade secrets might be used as an alternative and that actually could have a damaging effect on follow-on innovation because as we know, trade secrets the details in the invention aren't made public. But there was alternative views expressed, and those people said that they didn't think the patent system would be suitable for protecting um, AI devised inventions. And this was because they felt, uh, these people felt that AI was going to change the AI innovation environment. Um, we will see innovation, they said, coming sort of much faster, much cheaper and with a much high, higher turnover rate. And therefore they felt that the sort of the current system would not be suitable for that, particularly having sort of like an anti-competitive effect. Do you have the next slide, please? So the government responded by saying that they were, they were going to um, consult on a range of policy options for protecting AI devised inventions. Um, and actually, we are currently in the middle of that consultation, which went out at the end of October um, and finishes on the 7th of January. And I very much encourage uh, folks to uh, reply to that consultation. When we get to the last slide, I'm going to provide a link um, which will take you to the consultation. If you want, especially if you want to find out more details. Can have next slide, please, Lisa? Um, so if I quickly go through the policy options we've set out in our consultation. So the first option, option zero, um, we've proposed not changing the system, keep it maintaining the status quo so there'll be no patents for AI devised inventions. And in the call for views, we certainly had comments on those that said this actually may be the preferable option 
because for those um, patent applicants who operate internationally, it, it keeps uh, UK law consistent with international obligations and practice in the a area of a, um, AI inventorship, sorry, not AI, inventorship full stop. Um, and that international element is going to be quite an interesting one to consider when we go through the options as I'm going to present. So next slide, please, Lisa. OK, so the next two options is our proposal where, we, where the policy aim is the same. I we're going to change the we would change the law to allow AI device inventions to um, be patented. Now, although the effects, the policy effect is we think about the same, actually the legal options for doing this seemingly could have different impacts. Um, and this is what we're, we're asking folks to give some, some comments on in particular. So with the first option, we're suggesting that um, we change the definition of inventor in UK patent law and expanding it to include those humans that are responsible for making the arrangements for AI to devise an invention. The question we've put in the consultation is, if this is something that people think is suitable, who should those humans be? When the comments we had in the call for views, people suggested those humans could possibly be the, P, uh, the programmers, the AI programmers could be responsible, or possibly um, the, the, those who train AI with data. Um, a key feature of this option is that if we still name a human inventor, it will not necessarily be transparent that um, AI has been used to devise the invention. And for some commentators, transparency is really important and it wouldn't be delivered by this particular option. But others commented that maybe this, an option like this would be suitable being more in line with sort of international practice on inventorship. Can I have the next slide please, Lisa? For our second option, um, we suggest changing the law in two ways, uh, allowing AI to be named as inventor or actually no, no requirement to name AI inventor. Both of those would actually make it transparent um, that AI had been the inventor, even option B, because that would be clear um, on the openly available patent application. In both these situations, unlike option one, we would actually have to add an additional entitlement um, qualification. Um, and we have suggested that that qualification is the same one as we've used in option one, i.e. it's the humans that are responsible for making the arrangements um, for AI to devise the invention. Some people will recognize that um, test as we borrowed it from um, UK copyright law, where it's used to identify authors for computer generated works. Um, again, um, the question would be who would actually be humans who would actually own inventions in these circumstances. And we're, we're, we're very keen for people to give comments. I mean, apart from the, the, the folks that I mentioned in the sort of for option one, other other people have said that it should be the AI owner should be the one who actually gains the patent rights. And finally, we come down to the sort of probably the most radical suggestions. So have a new slide, please, Lisa. So this is would be the alternative um, new um, right. And as you can see, this, this the, um, the slide is fairly white because we really can't give too much detail on this, unlike the other options. Essentially, what we're asking here is for more information from those who actually suggested that this might be the way to go. Um, what we want is basically more detail on it. 
we haven't got enough to sort of suggest what that might le look like legally, but we've set out maybe some broad principles for people to give comment on in the consultation. So effectively what we're, we're looking at is for a sort of a right that strikes a balance between protecting and incentivizing AI inventions, but without unreasonably restricting wider competition and innovation. So it'd be a pattern like right uh, we've suggested perhaps for a sh with a shorter term, and this might address those who felt the inventions um, would be coming more quickly and more cheaply. Um, we could also consider sort of like patentability requirements. So for example, you could treat a separate system like this differently in terms of how you establish inventive step. Um, alternatively, you might go for something which actually will see patents being granted much faster because you expect a higher innovation turnover. So maybe you could actually take away um, the, uh, the examination for inventive step. So quite radical thoughts um, and people might have some sort of um, comments on maybe sort of the two systems running together if you have this, the, um, the choice to actually choose one or another if you've actually got lesser rights on one. So for the final slide, Lisa. So coming back again to flag the fact that we're running this consultation, here's the link. Um, I think these slides are gonna be published, Gwilym. I don't know if you can nod, is that correct? Yeah, so people will have access to this web link. It gives you um, access to both the patents and copyright aspects of the consultation. And just to say again that it closes on Friday the 7th of January, so apologies for probably taking up some of people's Christmas holidays if they're going to be answering that consultation. Thanks so much, Nikki. And yes, let's make those sure those slides are, are available and thanks for sharing them. Um, and thanks for a, a, a rapid run through a lot of content now. I think we're in the, this is the second consultation, of course. This is the one that follows on from the first consultation. Um, and certainly that last option you mentioned there, the kind of the concept of a whole new right, that's where the, the philosophy MA comes in useful because we are starting to move into very interesting areas, somewhere between um, our law and science fiction, which is the place where uh, my next speaker and I cross over. And just a reminder that that's a fantastic rundown of the, the, the UK position. This is a global issue. And I think a point we will be touching on later is just how global do we need this consensus to be? And um, Robin stated his comment, my, my overwhelming comment is we need a global solution. Ryan, you obviously in the middle of all of this in, in many, uh, many areas, um, really interested to hear your latest update on how things are going and what your views are. Well, thank you for the overly generous introduction and the book pitch. And I just Venmoed you per the arrangement. And, and Nikki also, I think it is wonderful that the UK IPO is doing the consultation in this manner. Uh, these Davis cases, which I and a group of patent attorneys are doing around the world, which we've grandiosely styled the Artificial Inventor Project. Next slide. I'd like to talk a bit about, you know, beginning with Can I AI Invent? And I'd like to start by talking about someone else's case study. This is a case study that Siemens provided at the 2019 first conversation on AI and IP hosted by WIPO. And the green thing is a car suspension and the silver thing is a car suspension designed by an AI. And Siemens wanted to file for a patent on the silver car suspension and decided they were unable to because the engineers at Siemens involved with this said, essentially that they hadn't done anything inventive. They had an AI that optimized industrial components. It had publicly available information about car schematics. Uh, they told it what they wanted, which was well known, out popped this design, which was obviously interesting and valuable to all of them. Uh, but none of them did anything that they thought made them inventors. And so as a result, Siemens couldn't get a patent on a valuable new industrial design. And leaving aside issues of AI inventorship, which are important, this is really the commercial issue. Can you patent this sort of innovation? And you know, it may come up because German engineers have moral feelings about being named as inventors, but it is not entirely you know, a matter of that. In the United States, for example, uh, inaccurately listing an inventor on an application in bad faith makes that patent unenforceable and can even be a criminal offense if done deliberately and accurately. Uh, next slide. 
I find that when people talk about can AI invent, they're often talking about different sorts of things. Um, because of course, we don't have artificial general intelligence, not Davis or anything. We don't have a machine that could do anything a person could do. Uh, we don't have strong AI in the sense of a machine that thinks and has semantic understanding the same way a person does. So Davis didn't turn itself on and decide to invent. Davis invented because it was told to invent. You know, but that is really not dissimilar from the way large companies, uh, which hire research scientists, instruct them to invent new useful things like car suspensions. Um, sometimes someone can invent something by finding a problem to be solved, but not usually. Uh, sometimes someone can invent by training an AI or programming an AI to solve a problem, uh, but not if they are designing an AI with some general set of capabilities like parametric optimization of industrial components and a different person is using that AI, in that case, they wouldn't even know what design the AI had come up with or its claims. You, you couldn't be an inventor under US or UK law on that basis. Uh, finally, you might be an inventor by recognizing the value of an AI's output. And that seems to work in some cases where maybe Pfizer has an AI that says, here's 10 antibodies to treat COVID, go find the best one. Uh, but not so much if it says, I've looked through a billion antibodies in my library. Here's the one with the highest binding affinity, 99.99% likelihood it's the best. And here's all the data you need for a patent application. No one's exercised any inventive skill there. Uh, next slide. And, and whether or not someone could on a non-traditional basis be, be a patent inventor, of course, the law could change for that. And, and there are a variety of ways to solve the commercial problem. Uh, you know, of course, AI is used in research and development all the time without making an AI an inventor. Um, but, you know, the law on this is A, not harmonized. So the US, the UK and Germany have different laws around what makes someone an inventor. Uh, and also, frankly, perhaps not that well um, elaborated on in certain jurisdictions where this sort of thing doesn't come up that often, but does come up where Projects are collaborative. Many people can be involved in making an invention. Only some of them were really inventors, depending on what we mean by that. And that will sometimes mean different parties have different entitlement rights where people are working, for example, for different organizations. Next slide. To give a, a very brief, because I only have a few minutes discussion of how Davis invents, uh, it, it's a series of neural networks. In the 1990s, it started with two. You have one neural network that you train on car suspension designs. It then automatically perturbs the connection weights between neurons. And so what this does is it spits out new designs that have never been seen before. Uh, you train a critic network with what you are looking for, for example, a car suspension that maximizes friction. And as it starts spitting out new designs, the critic network will look at it and say, aha, here's a design that maximizes friction. Next slide. You know, 20 years later, these systems now have thousands or, or more neural networks. Each neural network basically um, coding for a concept like heat transfer or currency or death. And the machine is trained by a person to combine basic concepts into simple concepts. And then in unsupervised runs, um, combines basic complex, basic ideas into complex ideas that are essentially patent claims. And it will identify when a claim has value as the machine is, is told to look for certain things. And this can be something narrow, like I want the car suspension design that promote, you know, that maximizes friction, or I want something that helps prevent death. Uh, it did find something that helped prevent death in the form of a flashing light that could attract human attention. And so uh, next slide. That is something that I and a group of patent attorneys uh, internationally filed a series of patent applications on. And we named, uh, we filed these in the UK and in Europe because for 18 months you didn't have to disclose uh, inventorship. And they were preliminarily evaluated by both offices and found to be substantively patentable. So they were new, had an inventive step and, and were useful. Uh, and then we corrected the inventorship and said, well, actually there is no person who actually devised this invention. Uh, this machine was not told to invent these things. It identified them as having value before a person saw them, uh, and therefore the AI invented it. N no one's ever suggested that the AI would own the patent, um, both because it couldn't legally, but even to change the law, it just wouldn't make a lot of sense. We could talk about that. 
in, in point of fact, most inventors don't own their patents. The, the vast majority of patents are owned not by people, but by artificial persons, largely in the form of corporations. And, and most patents are owned by a fairly small group of corporations. Um, and in this case, the applicant, Dr. Thaler, who was the person who developed and used Abbas is listed as the applicant. So Dr. Thaler owns these applications uh, with the AI as the inventor. Now, there isn't a statutory basis for that, right? The entitlement question, who would own this sort of thing? It was easier in our case because you didn't have a bunch of compelling third-party claims of ownership. Uh, but these are also issues that common law systems have grappled with for a long time. Uh, you know, there is, for example, a doctrine called accession by which you own property by virtue of owning some other property. So if I own a fruit tree, I own the fruit from the tree. If I own a cow, I own its calf. If I own a 3D printer and it prints a beverage container, I own that beverage container. So if I own an AI that makes a design for a beverage container, why wouldn't I own that in a similar sort of way? You know, these are challenges that property law and common law systems are, are used to dealing with. But as long as there is a clear rule of entitlement, the parties will largely work these things out by contract. Next slide. In July of this year, South Africa granted us a patent, uh, our first patent with Dabis listed as the AI and the patent is owned by Dr. Thaler. And next slide. And three days later, Justice Beach uh, provided an extensive reasoned decision finding that AI generated invention should be protected. Uh, there's no reason an AI couldn't qualify as a patent inventor. And at least in our case, Dr. Thaler had the best claim of entitlement, but I will let him speak to that. Next slide. Not all courts have come around to this line of thinking. Uh, the U.S. Eastern District of Virginia rejected our appeal from a denial of the patent office there. Uh, this has just been appealed to the federal circuit. Uh, I filed the opening brief in that last week, so that's on the agenda. Next slide. We also had the denial from the UK IPO upheld recently by the Court of Appeal in the UK. Uh, the Supreme Court is deciding right now whether to accept an appeal on this matter. The Court of Appeal did split on this, however, with Lord Justice Burst finding there should be no prohibition on patenting an invention of this nature. Uh, Lord Justice Arnold and Lady Justice Lang um, upheld the denial. Next slide. And it isn't just going on through the courts. In addition to UK IPOs consultation, uh, the government of India recently finished a parliamentary consultation which suggested the law should be changed to explicitly provide protection for AI generated inventions. Next slide. And the president of South Korea recently announced that AI generated inventions should be explicitly protected. So I think increasingly jurisdictions are realizing that our AI strategy and as part of that our AI and IP rules are a critical component of industrial strategy for AI and even national security and are looking to have policies that promote innovation. You know, in our case, allowing this sort of thing protected allows a company like Pfizer to use an AI to make new drugs instead of a team of people. If, as you do in the life sciences, a patent is very important. And that's critical because, you know, to restrict companies from using AI in that way essentially builds in inefficiencies into R&D processes and may be particularly disruptive after AI becomes a significantly better way of creating some sorts of innovations than people. Uh, and I will end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ryan. And um, again, that's, that's obviously a pretty pro uh, position on the patenting of um, AI generated inventions. Just to remind the audience, if you've not spent a lot of time thinking about this before, there's a bunch of questions here and we're focusing on one, which is can AI uh, invent or should AI be allowed to invent or should we be able to get patents by, for things that AI has invented? Ryan, as you've mentioned, it's not about ownership by AI. That's an even bigger philosophical question. Let's not perhaps go too far into that now, although as you say, Nikki, one of these days, one might have to work out quite how it all fits together. Um, nor is it the patentability of AI, which again is another interesting area, but but not not for today's discussion. Um, but the inventorship question in itself is incredibly important, and we're seeing different points of view now appearing around the world. Um, good news about South Africa. We'll come to uh, Justice Beach shortly after um, Karina's talk. Um, and I think the EPO, of course, is also looking at the case at the moment as well, and the Board of Appeal is going to be on it fairly soon. So lots of positions being developed um, around the world. One thing I would say is that the slide from the film Ex Machina um, is great film, 
definitely watch it. May not make you too fond of AI. Um, <laughs> I don't know how, how, that, how that pushes you in the direction of, of which way you think about the whole thing. Um, and obviously there are loads of nuanced positions about it, Ryan, you've, you've touched there on, on the basic question. Does it, do people really accept that AI actually can invent irrespective of <clears throat> the legals? And as the blurb for this session mentions, um, the, that wasn't really addressed by our courts of appeal. In fact, versus dissenting decision was actually more on a formality point, which is quite interesting. Um, but nobody actually addressed the AI question per se in that decision, as I understand it. Well, yeah, very, very briefly, because um, I know we, we're going to talk at the end. Justice mm. Beach actually's uh, opinion did require submissions on this point. So the court in Australia, I believe, did look at this. Justice Burse, incidentally, uh, was at an EP law event with me last week where he mentioned that 10 years ago, he had a case involving an AI generated invention where it simply wasn't at issue. So he said he saw, you know, no, no. Uh, you know, well, a, a for the purpose of the appeal, the UK IPO did not dispute the claim that the AI had invented this. Um, um, this is exercising minds around the world. Um, the Charter Patent Institute of Patent Attorneys had a good old think about this, um, and even within that small group, there's 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 a, there's a nuanced range of, of views on it. And Karina, I'm going to hand over you to kind of talk through what you lot thought. Yes, and as you say, it's not uh, a topic where everybody um, can reach easily consensus. And this is one of the reasons why this particular area is so challenging for patent attorneys. So a patent attorney has to advise uh, clients on whether they want to obtain or should obtain a patent and can obtain a patent for their innovative technology. And if we don't have clarity in the law, um, that's going to be incredibly difficult going forward, where we're talking about really quite sophisticated um, uh, AI systems being involved to a greater or lesser extent, extent with innovation. Um, uh, next slide, please. So these are just to sum up the two problems that we currently face uh, when it comes to inventions that have involved a very advanced AI system where arguably one could say that an AI system has been an inventor. The, the issue really uh, from a patent attorney perspective is more the fact that when we're talking to a client, we always want to identify an inventor because that is what determines ownership. And if we can't identify a human, i.e. a natural person as an inventor, then we have an issue when it comes to patentability, because if we can't name a human as an inventor, as the law currently stands, you would not be able to obtain a patent. But also, if you found later on when you were challenging perhaps a, a patent um, that you cannot identify a human inventor, then in fact, uh, you have an issue when it comes to ownership, because if a human inventor cannot be identified, under the current legislative framework, derivation of rights through ownership of the invention will not meet the requirements of the UK Patents Act. And so the applicant would not be entitled to the granted patent for the invention. Next slide, please. So uh, the challenge also that patent attorneys face when we're advising clients is that we are always looking to the global picture because many um, of our clients will want to seek um, patent protection uh, on a worldwide basis. And at the moment, the way uh, an inventor is defined differs between different legal jurisdictions. And just to sort of put this into some perspective, um, in the UK, an inventor is the actual divisor of the invention. However, in the US, they define the term inventor to be the individual who invented or discovered the subject matter of the invention, which is subtly different. And in the US, they qualify that with the, you know, the general approach as a patent attorney is we talk about reduction to practice. And this comes from the concept that conception is the touchstone of inventorship, where conception is the formation in the mind of the inventor of a definite and permanent idea of the complete and operative invention as it is hereafter to be applied in practice. So they're very different approaches that currently um, will normally, as long as you do actually have the same um, invention, and you may not, you may have subtle differences in different legal jurisdictions, but you'll get the same result when it comes to assessing inventorship where a human is involved. But of course, if we can't name a human um, as an inventor, we've got a problem. Next slide, please. And, and I want to really point out a very fundamental point here that the actual inventions, as, as Ryan um, nicely demonstrated, they're not what we would call computer implement inventions. We're not talking about patenting a system or an algorithm or code. We're talking here about something very practical in the con this context. It's, it's a beverage container. 
and there's absolutely no indication from the claim that a human inventor was not involved. In other words, one would assume reading that normally um, that there was a human inventor or inventors involved. And therefore, there wasn't an issue. And as Ryan points out, you know, you can file an application naming somebody um, who you might believe to be the inventor. But if you uh, later realize that they are not the inventor, strictly speaking, one should correct that and identify the correct inventor. And this often happens in real life when you have human inventors because the claims will change as we prosecute them. And sometimes you'll bring in a feature um, perhaps uh, from elsewhere in your patent application and that will change the group or, or individuals who you would name as inventorship. So that's a, a routine thing that happens. We sometimes change who we name as the inventor as the claims of an invention evolve towards grant. Um, but of course, if you find when you're prosecuting your application that, hold on a minute, what we're now reduced to isn't something where I'm comfortable naming a human inventor because I can't do that under the usual tests. And if I, we go to the next slide, please. Um, just to give you some a sort of pointer here, we would not normally say somebody is an inventor, they don't actually contribute to what's inventive. So we claim various features, but we'll normally have at least one feature, which is novel and inventive. And that's what's really contributing um, to, to, to the ability for the claim as a whole to generate patent rights. And so you may have somebody whose only contribution, in fact, turns out to be um, doing something that's routine, you know, um, exercise of the ordinary skill in the art. Or it could be that they're just performing some routine ex uh, experiments or they're assembling an invention only by exercising ordinary skill in the art. And you'll notice I put on this some one thing. If you only contribute an obvious element of the invention, obviously, that doesn't make you an inventor, nor are you normally considered an inventor if you just conceive of the result but no idea how to achieve it, and nor would you normally be considered an inventor if you only discover a problem but not a solution. And normally we would not consider somebody or something who just provides a point or a suggestion to improvement but does nothing more than that. And you can see that some of these ways that we would normally assess inventorship can create real problems we're talking about certain sorts of inventions where an AI system has actually involved and has made a contribution and we cannot necessarily because of the disconnect between the human who has perhaps um, you know um, been involved in perhaps making some arrangements for that system with what actually comes out as being at the end of the day what you want to claim is your invention and and whilst you might think it is quite obvious because you'll discuss that initially often you don't as you know the applicant or the client will normally be uh, a corporate entity and it may be only that after you've done the claim you ask these questions that they say well hold on a minute no i'm, I'm not sure we can name a human inventor maybe they've uh, you know they consult the in-house team and as siemens found out they can't actually point to somebody uh, and say no i'm comfortable naming myself an inventor um, next slide, please. So, you know, some people have said so far, well, they may have done a bit of a fudge. Now, I personally don't think that fudging is particularly professional, and I also don't think it's particularly ethical. Um, but the reality is also there's, it's hugely risky if the subsequent litigation. As, as Ryan mentioned, in certain jurisdictions, you can lose not only the patent, but there's also potentially criminal sanctions if you deliberately try to deceive um, who is the inventor. In countries like Germany, you may have lack of standing to sue because in fact, at the end of the day, if you cannot identify an inventor uh, as a human entity, you may not have ownership of your patent. So this is why this consultation is so important and why it's really, I think, vital, whatever your views are, to contribute and respond to the UK IPO, um, because we need to fix this. Um, and also because, you know, um, we've got to have a consistent result. And I think it's vital at this point we can hear all sides of the story. Um, any human inventors named in a patent application should be able to meet the relevant patent law tests. Different patent offices and courts use for inventorship with consistent results. And if we don't have that, then we'll have an issue when it comes to advising our clients, um, you know, whether they should actually go through, whether they could end up going through the whole process of seeking patent protection, but not actually end up owning a patent at the end of the day, or there could be, uh, you know, different results in different countries. So we've got to have a globally harmonized approach. Next slide, please. Now, um, early on in the um, initial uh, call for views, uh, CIPA did put forward various proposals, and we couldn't actually um, uh, come to a consensus. There are various ways 
of resolving this. Um, it was recognized generally that the contribution of an AI system to invention may be such that human involvement falls short of a human being the actual device of the invention due to a significant contribution from an AI system. And one of the proposals put forward by CEPA was that, well, we could amend um, Section 7.3 of the UK Patents Act to specify that a person responsible for the output of the AI system, which provides the contribution should be regarded as an event. And that's subtly different from what the UK IPO um, has proposed in one of their options. Another um, proposal was that perhaps the person responsible for the output of the AI system could be denoted as the first owner rather than as the inventor. But of course, this could pre create problems because we still don't have an inventor named. And if international law and practice does not follow this approach, again, we could get um, different situations in different countries as regard patentability and ownership. And there were various other responses with different proposals submitted um, in response to the call for views. And I did have a, a, a look through many of them and I didn't really have a chance to summarize them all, but I just wanted to, to point out that there are lots of proposals put forward, but these actually have a real impact, I think at the end of the day, on whether we're going to be able to advise a client, you should go ahead and try to patent this or no, we can't give you that certainty due to this situation with a potential lack of an ability to name a human as an inventor. For now, keep this as a trade secret. Next slide, please. So we need some clarity at the moment and currently we're lacking it. I, I, I don't know if it's I'm pleased to say, but you know, the majority of AI systems we see at the, mo the moment, this is not an issue that comes into play. We don't need to have concerns about it. There are other issues that are, I think, far more pressing like the plausibility of the disclosure being enabling and all sorts of other things that are impacting a lot of patent attorneys who deal with AI far more than an assessment of whether we may have a contribution from an AI system that's um, sufficient uh, for us to not be able to name a human inventor under the current legislative framework. Um, but if we cannot advise our clients who we could name as a human inventor, then ownership of a patent for the invention created will not be clear. And so we need a, you know, some clarity over this. We need a globally harmonized approach. Um, and, and the real fundamental issue here is that patents are not cheap rights to obtain. They can have a huge commercial impact. They support innovation. They're you know, often critical for startups to obtain funding from investors. Um, the actual technology being invented by some of the system is, is very desirable. We're talking about areas where it comes to things like personalized medicine, um, you know, or autonomous vehicle technology. Some of it is very high tech, but obviously we do have other simpler inventions to do with um, you know, um, parts and, 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 and containers. But at the end of the day, from the patent attorney's perspective, the origin of an invention should not affect its patentability. And that is why we're having this debate now and really trying to engage with the inventor community to understand what will give us um, you know, the best possible solution going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Everyone's doing an amazing job of cramming the content into the time, which I really appreciate. Um, you've brought in a couple of interesting extra points there on um, fudging, fudging it, which I totally agree that it's not going to work for all kinds of ethical and legal reasons. And you've touched on something that um, Nikki touched on, which we may get to later, which is the whole impact on the skill in the art and where that, that goes. Um, We've got some questions coming in. Do please, everyone in the audience, do keep sending them in. There's, there's, there's so much to chew on here as well. But one point I think that links this and um, brings to the next speaker in a moment is this idea of the um, the, the global consistency and the, the requirement for that, that the international law and practice has to be aligned. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what you do in one country, it's going to cause mayhem elsewhere, which I think is absolutely right. Um, the UK consultation, IPO consultation, talks about common approaches with like-minded nations. If I may, I don't think it needs to be just like-minded nations, we just need the common approach. Um, I guess that will eventually mean the nations become like-minded, but I don't think they are yet. Um, and uh, I think one interesting position that we've seen then from Australia, which is which is a, a very progressive, I think, and congratulations to, to Justice Beach for kind of leading the way there, is is taking a, a fairly uh, straightforward, positive approach. It ties in with what you said, Karina, there about um, the, from a patent attorney perspective, the origin of the invention should not affect its patentability. Uh, what Sir Robin said at the beginning, and I think a, a quote from your from your judgment, uh, Justice Beach, about um, this, this approach is consistent with promoting innovation. We'd love to hear your perspective um, and how you you got to where you you are from an international point of view. 
Thank you. And uh, look, uh, I'm very pleased to have been invited to participate in this seminar. And I, and I must say that the, uh, the UK office is to be commended for uh, publishing its consultation paper, which um, sets out the options very nicely. Uh, now, no doubt, uh, international harmonization is, uh, of course, the, uh, the ultimate, but uh, unfortunately, it's likely to be a long term goal, I think. In the in the short term, any reform is uh, likely to be led by the United Kingdom and the EU. Uh, I've been following the UK developments over the years. I've been to London quite frequently, uh, uh, certainly up until eighteen months ago, and uh, I read uh, uh, some of the publications from the uh, House of Commons Science and Technology Committee reports uh, back to two thousand and sixteen and the like. And I've also read a lot of uh, EU material, particularly on robotics, which I was also interested in, and possible civil law rules that might be developed in terms of, uh, of liability questions. So it, it seems to me, yes, uh, international harmonization is the long term objective, but uh, I don't think uh, uh, we can all uh, wait for uh, treaties to be uh, signed off and then uh, implemented through uh, uh, national legislation, I, I suspect that uh, uh, the United Kingdom and the EU uh, are likely to and uh, should lead any reform in this area. Uh, uh, now, in terms of my uh, photo decision, you'll understand that I can't say very much about that. Uh, uh, that's uh, on appeal now, and that uh, appeal is going to be heard next uh, February, uh, uh, where no doubt uh, my uh, views will be uh, looked at uh, uh, quite carefully. So. Uh, what I propose to do is perhaps not uh, focus on that so much, but uh, say a few words about the consultation paper and the various options that the UK office has uh, put forward. Just to, as a starting point, it seems to me that uh, uh, there are a number of generic themes that um, might uh, be worth keeping in mind in terms of uh, looking at potential solutions. and. Uh, that the first generic theme is that any reform should reflect the reality of what is occurring now and what is likely to occur in the future. I think that's important. I think it's quite undesirable to try and distort or do something artificial, pardon the pun, in terms of solutions. I think that the first and primary objective is to ensure that any reform reflects the the underlying uh, reality. The, the second theme, which relates to the first theme, is that I'm uh, against temporary solutions, that is, solutions that merely kick the can or the problem down the road, uh, so to speak. I think if there is going to be a uh, reform, it, uh, it should be a reform that um, is uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, desirable for the uh, long term. The third theme is that uh, it seems desirable to uh, modify the existing system rather than to implement a new type of protection. You start implementing new types of protection, for example, copyright law in relation to computer codes and, and that sort of thing. And you, you then start getting a, a series of, of ad hoc solutions with no underlying theme, potential uh, inconsistency and the like. And it, it seems to me that uh, uh, a theme that uh, uh, is uh, desirable is to work with the existing system and see what modifications uh, need to be uh, made to that. Otherwise, as I say, you just lead to an accretion of ad hoc solutions with no cohesion or coherence to them. The fourth general theme is that um, you should make changes that are no more than necessary to solve the particular uh, problem. Now, if those four generic themes uh, have any force to them, and if you were to apply those four generic themes to the various options in the consultation paper, uh, it may uh, be seen that options zero one and three in the consultation paper may not have uh, that much going for them. And what uh, um, is left in the frame is perhaps uh, the most uh, fruitful avenue to pursue is 
uh, some uh, variety of option two. And of course, under option two, there are two possibilities. Now, just quickly going through these options, the option zero in the consultation paper was to make no legal change at all. Uh, I described that as the do nothing scenario. Uh, and I view that does not reflect the reality of who or what was the inventor. And further, if a human doesn't qualify as the or an inventor, it, this option has the undesirable consequences that you might have no examination of the, uh, the patent application and, and no uh, patent grant. Um, at best, this option is only a very short term uh, temporary solution. Now, people can debate uh, uh, at the moment as to whether you now have autonomous AI systems that create. Uh, but if we're not there yet, we soon will be. Um, so to my way of uh, uh, considering the matter, it seems to me that um, this uh, option zero uh, is perhaps the least realistic, but of course the simplest. Option one uh, is the option where uh, you either have a, a human inventor who's the actual divisor, or if uh, you don't, you still uh, use a human as the inventor uh, uh, by extending the concept to the person who made the arrangements necessary for the devising of the invention if the, uh, if the uh, invention was uh, devised by the AI. So uh, under that uh, possibility, you might have the programmer of the AI, you might have the operator of the AI, you might have the uh, person that uh, fed the training data and all sorts of other possibilities. But again, it seems to me that this option one uh, uh, doesn't in, in that uh, latter possibility truly reflect the reality of who or, or what was the uh, inventor. And it seems to me you're shoehorning a human into this second possibility uh, that uh, that is the person who arranges for the devising of the invention. Um, you should be wanting a, a human into that uh, possibility that uh, is uh, potentially not uh, justifiable. And also under that possibility, you may uh, uh, have disputes as to who would qualify under that extension. So it seems to me that uh, uh, option one is better than option zero, but uh, still less than desirable. Let me just uh, put option two to one side and I'll come back to that in a moment and just go uh, to option three, which is uh, a new type of protection. I think I said earlier, um, that would be an ad hoc uh, solution. And of course you'd have obvious difficulties if um, you were trying to fit um, uh, two systems together, if you had both uh, human and AI inventors, uh, you had a, a hybrid uh, position uh, you'd have to resolve the difficulty of which type of protection you'd be applying to, to that sort of hybrid scenario. But, but the other thing about uh, option three is that it seems to perhaps unnecessarily provoke uh, much uh, broader debates, because if you're going to have a new type of protection, uh, you're going to be talking about uh, uh, questions such as, should the protection be the same in terms of duration or should it be uh, different? And of course, that will throw open the uh, debates about, well, AI can generate more inventions at a lower cost. Um, if you've got a lot more inventions, this could hamper competition. So you then have this uh, balance between providing incentives for innovation outweighed by the inefficient economic costs flowing from hampering comp competition. So you'll get into those broader debates, which are difficult, but why get into them if you don't need to? Um, the other debate that you might get into with a new type of protection is this um, question as to whether the bar should be for patentability should be raised for AI generated inventions. Um, for example, should you have a high degree of industrial or technical application uh, uh, imposed or was some particular new bar? Um, for my part, I, I, I don't see why you wouldn't have the uh, same protection for AI generated inventions as you do for any other uh, invention. It seems to me that the incentives are the same. What you're really seeking to do is incentivize the creators of AI, computer engineers, and um, more relevantly uh, to uh, matters that I've been considering the use of AI in other fields to 
solve problems. And of course, if you accept uh, the premise that the protection should in, in substance be the same, then of course you, you undermine the foundation for uh, advocating for a different system. So uh, that's an interesting uh, option, but uh, uh, one that uh, has got uh, problems associated with it. Uh, it's, it's going to be difficult enough to internationally harmonize the position without uh, uh, trying to come up with different types of systems of protection that might be idiosyncratic to particular um, domestic jurisdictions. I think that's going to be counterproductive. If you want international harmonization, you should keep as, things as simple as possible and modify the existing uh, system that uh, around the world seems to be, uh, seems to have uh, common themes. Uh, now, finally, let me just uh, go quickly to uh, option two, which is in a sense, uh, removing the need uh, for a, a human inventor. In other words, just uh, accepting that um, you can have uh, uh, sole inventor as uh, AI. Now, there are two possible ways to deal with this. One is to amend legislation if necessary. Of course, in Australia, I expressed a view about that. But uh, one possibility is to amend the legislation to allow AI to be named as an inventor. Or uh, the second possibility is to uh, remove the requirement to name an inventor if the invention is devised by AI only. Now, all else being equal, I, I still take the view that the preferable possibility is to allow the AI to be named as the inventor. It reflects the reality uh, or the likely reality in the future. It reduces the risk of any misappropriation of the invention. And uh, of course, though, so, uh, there have to be considered uh, questions of title and, uh, and property considerations. And I expressed some views about that in my decision, uh, which are self-explanatory. Uh, Lord Justice Arnold expressed some views uh, about that in his, uh, his uh, reasons in the United uh, Kingdom uh, Court of Appeal that uh, I don't need to say uh, anything about. Now, it may be said that if you uh, have legislation which allows uh, uh, an AI to be named as the inventor, that that might have difficulty uh, to get patent protection in other jurisdictions where you don't have to, uh, where that's not permitted. In other words, assume that the other jurisdictions only allow humans to be named as inventors. Um, but I'm not sure that, that, that that's a problem because uh, the foundation for the problem is that you don't have a human inventor, uh, so uh, you're allowing AI to be an inventor. Uh, but if you don't have a human as an inventor, then you're not going to get protection around the world in uh, statutory regimes where where only humans are allowed. So uh, interesting uh, question, but I'm not sure that it uh, uh, really uh, 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 warrants uh, uh, putting a position forward that. Um, you shouldn't allow AI to be named as an inventor. One interesting matter that was very briefly touched on in the consultation paper in option two was the question about um, uh, inventive step and uh, more particularly the, the, the question of uh, the, whether there should be different attributes being credited to the person uh, skilled in the art. Uh, interestingly, Lord Justice Burris uh, discussed the, the, the matter very briefly by, by essentially saying, well, uh, you're dealing with a notional person that has attributes which no real human does or could have, the hypothetical person skilled in the art. So uh, he didn't see any ramifications if I, I was the inventor for the question of uh, inventive step, and uh, he considered, and I've expressed uh, similar views that the objective standard would uh, still be applied. But of course, you might have uh, interesting questions about the uh, prior art. Um, uh, 
obviously uh, the prior art that we're talking about is in the field of the invention, which is the AI's output. It's not prior art in the field of computer engineering as such. Although interestingly, if um, the AI's output has been produced through machine learning, there may be an argument for saying that the prior art base should include any training data used to uh, generate the output. But um, this question of prior art is more interesting generally in terms of your, your hypothetical person skilled in the art as to whether they can be taken to have an available and an AI tool to search for and access the availability and relevance of prior art. Um, and, um, and if so, that may be said to raise the bar and therefore the risk of invalidity. But that, that's a, a more general issue for inventions well beyond those purely uh, generated uh, by, by AI. We're at that stage now where um, it might be said that um, for certain types of inventions, and let's assume that they're not ultimately AI generated, for some types of inventions, uh, the hypothetical person skilled in the art um, might be uh, taken to have access to uh, uh, AI uh, and uh, to uh, be able to, to use that. But something I don't need to go into any further. It's, a, it, it's, it, it's an issue that uh, will need to be addressed over, the, over time, I suspect, uh, through uh, uh, judicial decisions more than uh, legislation. But um, it, it is an issue that's uh, also going to be, have to be grappled with uh, at some stage, as well as this underlying question, the subject of the consultation paper. So uh, having said that, uh, and, uh, I see in my background that the, uh, the sun's come up in, uh, in Melbourne. So, it's probably a good uh, time to, to uh, uh, perhaps uh, allow for uh, some questions. Thank you so much. And how apt that you are literally speaking from the future. I think that's perfectly relevant to the conversation today. And thank you also for the amount of thought and attention put into that. Nikki, I'm sure there were some excellent thoughts there for you on the consultation. Um, and, you know, you've covered off all the options. Um, we've got the questions are coming in thick and fast. I've been desperately trying to listen and categorize them because there's a little bit of commonality between them. But I'm going to start off with uh, there's two or three questions come in linked to the same issue and one that you touched on at the end there um jonathan to do with the the impact on inventiveness and if we have ai um as as an inventor and therefore as a skilled person how that affects um <clears throat> the question of obviousness and i'm gonna actually turn to yeah ryan's ready <laughs> ryan ryan's ready for this one ryan over to you <laughs> Well, I, I'm an academic, so I always have something to say to everything. It may or may not be intelligent, but I, I can certainly say something. Uh, you know, the the argument I think is this, that the standard of a skilled person is explicitly not based on the standard of what an inventor would find obvious, which is a whole lot more than we allow under the current system. So whether as a legal matter, an AI could be an inventor really shouldn't have a bearing on this. That standard is based on a hypothetical you know, heuristic of what essentially an average researcher would find obvious. Whether or not an AI can be an inventor, if we ever get to a place where the average researcher is someone who uses an AI to solve problems, you know, the person using an inventive AI, uh, then the question is really what that person using that AI would find obvious, you know, or if you want to change the doctrine, perhaps what the AI would find obvious. And I do think there are ways to do that test. But, but as Justice Speech said, even now, it may be in some fields that it is just common for pharmaceutical researchers to use AI, and that this both expands the amount of prior art they already use in coming up with solving problems and gives them some new problem solving capabilities like recognizing patterns in large data sets. So, you know, so just the way that Europe has said a skilled person could be a team of people, you know, it may already be a team of people using AI and may one day be a team of people using inventive AI, you know, but that will happen as a matter of fact, not a matter of whether an AI can be a legal inventor. Thank you. Any comments from the panel on the complexities there? I have to say... So I was gonna hand it to Karina first and then Jonathan, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I was just going to say on a very practical basis, I agree with what Ryan was saying, it should not, we have a notional person skilled in the art, and therefore it should not actually make a difference whether we, at the moment we have 
AI inventors, we're using AI to locate prior artists. It is at some point we will be able to train systems to assess inventorship. But the, nonetheless, I think the way the law currently would interpret obviousness relies on the sort of notional person and whether that is a team involving an AI inventor, as Ryan was saying, as a tool or whether they were functioning in a more autonomous manner, I think we'll be able to adapt going forward as long as we have a consistent approach. But I don't think we should have a two tiered system where we differentiate origin um, of, of a particular technical problem to the way that we assess obviousness. Jonathan. Yes, I agree entirely with that. And uh, if, if you are uh, going to change the, uh, the, uh, the test for inventive step, you, you, it's been suggested that you might have to do something uh, radical, which uh, in one extreme version was to replace the hypothetical person skilled in the art by an algorithm trained uh, with uh, data from the designated field of art. So you'd be coming up with uh, an entirely different concept, if you were to, uh, to try and focus in on uh, AI specifically in terms of uh, a bespoke uh, regime for dealing with inventive step. Thank you. Oh, Nikki, hands up. Thanks, Gwilym. Um, yeah, we, we did have a number of comments about um, the question of inventive step uh, and, and, and the sort of the, the, the person skilled in the art and how sort of naming AI as an inventor might impact on that. But we also had other comments saying, you know, that the, the two things are separate. I think there might actually be some sort of thoughts which may be linking them to in the sense of that, that there was concern about um, sort of granting patterns in the scenario of um, the autonomous generation of inventions by AI. So, um, and I think Justin Beach actually sort of sort of brought that into more of a sort of like the, the, the near term rather than what was suggested in, in the console, in the, in the call for views, which was actually, is probably something for, for a great distant future. But the feeling was that um, if, if patents were available, for AI devised inventions in the situation that um, there's autonomous generation invention, was that the right thing? I know our call for views actually didn't sort of ask for comments of, for that particular AI environment, but it's an interesting one because everybody says, well, inventor step will be the sort of the sort of the determinant about in terms of, you know, will there be masses of um, patterns granted? No, inventor step will step will sort of effectively sort of cut that off because of the, you know, sort of what was determined to be uh, the person skilled in the art that, etc. Um, but it's an interesting one because um, there's also the suggestion that there may be struggles with um, that and um, sort of how inventive step will work in in with with AI as the sort of the more common inventor. So um, I suppose the question may be for the consultation is if people are sort of confident that if they have concerns about um, autonomous generation inventions, that the current system and maybe the development with sort of the um, the, the courts giving their view here, um, the system works and that we don't necessarily have to look elsewhere beyond inventorship. Thank you. Thanks for that. And um, it does actually draws us into a kind of another batch of questions actually um, related to one of the possible outcomes, which is we see kind of a plethora of inventions um, approaching. Um, the policy kind of document that the IPO has turned out actually discusses quite a few different perspectives. It discusses the legal perspective. It discusses the economic perspective. And, and as we keep touching on, it also touches the philosophical perspective, which is which is interesting. But um, we've got, I'm going to link up kind of three, apologies to anyone whose questions I don't get to, because they're, they're coming in thick and fast now. But I'm going to put three together and let's just tie them up because they're different points of view. One question, why does it matter who is named as an inventor? Another question, what about depriving human algorithm operators from having a right to an invention? Um, and then kind of a, a rather longer one, um, to do with the idea that uh, when AI kicks off and starts inventing, is that not going to provide a huge innov innovative advantage to those businesses that have the resources to actually have AI capable of doing these things? I love these philosophical ones. Ryan, you're, you're up again by the look of it. Sure. I think I might have missed. Did you want an answer to all three of those things? Choose whichever one you like. They're all interesting. 
Well, I, I think Karina did a great job of explaining why it mattered if you don't have a human inventor. I mean, one, to the extent that you may need an inventor to get a patent. So if you can't list a machine and there isn't a person who meets the criteria, then there's no patent. You know, and it also matters for chain of title purposes. Um, you know, in the UK, it goes straight to the employer under Section 7B, I think. Uh, but, you know, other jurisdictions, it flows through the inventor. So it, it is relevant to... Um, to a number of issues there. You know, as to industry consolidation, I tend to agree with that. Although Dr. Thaler is a, is a small business enterprise, right? So it isn't all owned by Google and Tencent. Uh, but to the extent that it will be, I, I would say essentially two things. One is that that is essentially already the case. The patent, you know, ownership is already very highly consolidated by a small number of large businesses like IBM and Siemens and Google. And, um, you know, if we have a problem with that, there are solutions built into competition or patent law to deal with those sorts of things, um, you know, or if we don't like the idea of patent thickets, there's new rules we could have around non-practicing entities. But if you really play it out and, and Google makes an AI through DeepMind that anytime we get a new pathogen, you know, can just come up with every possible treatment to it, vaccine and antibody, you know, that might result in some industry consolidation, but it is really what we ask for out of a patent system, which is better, faster innovation. Thank you. And if anyone else wants to come in on that one, otherwise there's plenty more. And I think- um, I yes, was going to just Karina. quickly say something, and that is, I think, and, and this sort of nicely builds on what Ryan was saying. I mean, there are currently huge challenges when it comes to um, sometimes determining ownership of AI inventions because you have potentially three different sources which could actually ultimately you know, have contributed to what it is you end up claiming. You've got the actual system architecture, the sort of hardware platform, and that might be owned by a large enterprise, particularly as we move towards um, actually having um, quantum computing where the investment in that hardware platform is massive. And then you'll have people who will be devising the algorithms, who will be running over that and exploiting the, the the hardware resources and then you have the people who are enabling um, access to those systems through their training data and who will actually be amassing um, basically uh, the information that the AI systems may need to learn in certain situations and um, when it comes to um, you know determining ownership it, it's vital that we can attribute an inventor whether it's a, a, a you know a, ideally under the current legislative framework we want to be able to identify a human inventor if we cannot do that who own it's not it's not like it's all come from one source. There are potentially multiple sources, and this is why we need clarity. And it's not a very straightforward situation to say who has actually contributed the um, uh, critical uh, feature that under current patent law we'd be able to get patent rights if we could name a human inventor if we're in a situation where we can't do it. So it's very important to determine ownership. Um, and I think from the just to sort of touch on the the situation, could we end up being flooded with lots of um, inventions? That's really a, a basically um, you know a fee based thing. There's lots of ways of managing that, but at the end of the day, um, there's lots of trends in how you assess inventive step. That's that little nuance that helps us distinguish an invention from the prior art, and that does have in different fields it goes up and down that sort of gap. It's very subjective, but people who work in the profession do know it's it's, it's sometimes a little bit um, different from one field to the other, but at the end of the day you know it's up to the patent offices to manage their workflow i think through appropriate fee structure that's one very simple solution that would avoid huge floods of um, ai created um, inventions where we ha somehow contrive to name a human inventor or whether we're able to name an ai inventor from overwhelming the patent system globally thank you and nikki i hope you're taking notes oh you've not only taken notes you want to say something go 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 yeah, okay. I, so I might just sort of like be a bit, uh, provoke a bit here, but I think if in terms of, I think a, a lot of the um, sort of the, the, the panelists have started off from the presumption that we need patents um, to protect these things. Have we actually sort of taken the step back and thought about why do we need patents to protect these things? So we've had the, so, uh, Ryan talked already about um, that um, there's already a small number of potential patent owners. Um, is, is this actually um, how we would like this sector to operate? Would we not want a more sort of sort of healthy, sort of thriving, competitive 
um, sector. I'm putting this up. This is not a government view. I'm just challenging people because I think we have come in. Everybody set started off with the presumption uh, patterns must be right here. Um, now I accept that it's um, it's an interesting question because, of course, as Karina really rightly pointed out, what we're talking about here is all technologies, sort of from very tiny sort of widgety things to sort of like big blockbuster pharmaceuticals, etc. Um, but I think it is, is an interesting question. If AI is going to change the innovation environment, and do we believe that, and radically so, are we just going to operate on the same model, or do we need to have sort of different thinking? And is the, this the right time to do it? Well, Gwilym, you're on mute. I was going to say this, but Karina politely put her hand up, so maybe we should start with her. <laughs> I, I, I hear where Nikki's coming from, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, um, a, a, a pattern is there to, it, it, you know, innovative technology benefits society as a whole. We want to encourage people to share those developments as quickly as possible. We get a rapid pace of innovation coming through. Um, the patent system supports that because people are able to share information, get their technology out there, form effective collaborations, and at the same time, if they obtain their patent rights, uh, can control the commercial exploitation of that technology. And I think we have to particularly, really, we can't stick our heads in that, the sand and pretend AI is not going to change the way that we live our lives. It's already changing it. And I think that's something, you know, um, various people have various sort of emotive resistances to the fact that AI is now becoming so ubiquitous. But we have to, I think, encourage transparency. And I am very... Um, conscious of the fact that people will already be um, you know, um, concerned about in certain technical fields where arguably you can't name a human inventor. Well, should we keep this as a trade secret? It's still an IP asset. We've got the trade secrets um, directive, although we're out of the EU, there's equivalent legislation in the UK, but that doesn't provide the same level of protection, particularly, of course, if you have to disclose perhaps for a regulatory board. So we've got to think about if we really want to understand how AI is impacting society, We've got to encourage whenever possible that the technology, whether we acknowledge the AI system as an inventor or not, but we want to make it transparent what's actually happening. And the AI, the patent system is one way of supporting that. So I think we do have to encourage um, the patent system to support AI innovation in AI, particularly in the UK, when it's one of our sort of key areas of entrepreneurship and development and has so much support from the government. Ryan. Well, I, I guess I don't need to sell AI inventorship as interesting given the number of participants you got. But one of the reasons I think it is interesting and, um, you know, part of the reason we did these test cases was to get more work for patent attorneys and to marginally make us more interesting than tax attorneys, is that it really gets to some fundamental questions about how we protect purely human acts of, of innovation. You know, I, I think your question asks at a basic level, should we have the patent system as the means by which we generate innovation, promote disclosure of information and commercialization of new technologies? And, and I think in fairness, the answer is a complex one and often industry dependent, you know, in the life sciences, I don't think you could have a functioning life sciences industry without patents or something like patents, you know, market exclusivity, but, but changed a bit. In software industries, that sort of thing might be less important. And that is a longstanding, you know, debate people have about the patent system. You know, that being said, if, as the UK fundamentally does support the patent system, the, the rationale for it is just as strong with AI generated inventions as with human generated ones, because if this is the incentive that causes people to do these things that we want them to do, then these are the incentives that will get people to make, build, and use machines that will get us to do things that we want to do, right? I mean, essentially, we have this sort of starting amount of prior art. We have this process by which we generate some socially valuable outcome. And the theory of the patent system is it will promote this process that we will otherwise not get an optimal amount of. And this is the big incentive that we have you know, and whether then you have GSK going to 400 research scientists saying we need a new vaccine for COVID-25 or Johnson & Johnson going to an AI and saying we need a new vaccine to COVID-25, you know, this is the system that we use to promote that sort of activity. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so Robin, oh, sorry, so Robin first and then Jonathan, does that's okay. Um, you kind of came in on, you need to unmute. You came in on this 
point in a sense. Uh, it's a basic benefit to society. But I know you've got some comments. I've got a bunch of comments, and I think maybe a, 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 well, I'll just run them. First of all, the trade secret argument is a bit of a non-starter because that only applies to processes. Once the thing's out there, it's not a trade secret. So that, that's not a helpful sort of, uh, it's a side bit, really. Um, legally, I just want to make this point. We once had a system where the inventor was not the man who devised it. I grew up in such a system. If you went abroad and found out what they were up to there, you came back and you were the inventor. And that was the word we used. So the word inventor can include somebody who didn't think of it themselves. Whether the current act does that is another question, but the word inventor is wide enough and has historically been so. The next point I wanna make is that we're stuck with AI. It's no good saying it's not happening, pretend it shouldn't be happening and so on and so forth. It's happening. And we touched upon the subject of what amounts to inventiveness. Well, that's good. AI is gonna change all that. We have a fundamental rule that our notional person skilled in the art or team is skilled in the art, picks up a document, they read it, use their common general knowledge. And if that makes it obvious, it does. But if it doesn't, it doesn't. And then he picks up another document. And unless there's a reason for reading one with the other, he starts the same exercise all over again. The anti-mosaicing rule. Well, AI will mosaic like mad. And it will render inventions which once weren't obvious, or which wouldn't have been obvious, they will be obvious. So if you've got, as it were, the AI knocking patterns down, it ought to be AI putting them up too. And my third and page final point is one that Ryan's just touched upon, is so many inventions, I began with it before, but it is really important to understand that this notional naive idea of the patent system being something where you put a patent application in, that's the idea and the public can have it 20 years later uh, and you get the monopoly in between, it, it is naive. That's not how it works, particularly for really important uh, farmer inventions and the like. What actually you've got is a license, a kind of prospecting license. You know, nobody else can come in, like, like, just like gold mining in, the, in, in America. You, 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 you've got a, uh, an area, you should, you've got to pay the license from the government, you've got your area and you dug for gold and you could find it, you've got it. And if not, you just lost your money. And that's how the system really works. And if we are going to be really, keen on in innovation and investment in innovation, we've got to have AI patentability and we're going to have in any event, whether we don't have patentability or not, we're going to have AI being a useful tool for destroying patents. That which was not obvious now will be in the future by, by a different system. Our, our legal construct of the person skilled in the art will not stand. Right, I'm gonna shut up now. I've said all my bit. Thank you so much. Um, Justice Beach, I think you're going to come in. Well, unsurprisingly, I agree with everything Sir Robin <laughs> says. Uh, uh, always easy. Is. Too. <laughs> I was actually uh, uh, anticipating your point. We, we are stuck with AI. I put, put to one side the question of AI inventorship. Um, the the uh, person skilled in the art uh, is um, and may be taken to be taking into account AI technology so they'll uh, that'll be relevant to assessing obvious and obviousness and if you don't take that into account then you're going to uh, produce unwarranted monopolies being granted where the technologies were employed and even if the ai technology wasn't used uh, uh, it, it should still be taken into account uh, by in terms of your hypothetical person skilled in the art test otherwise you'd be rewarding ignorance in terms of uh, the state of the art so um, AI is here, it's being used. Uh, and uh, if that ultimately results in a, a smaller number of, uh, of larger players, well, well, well so be it, but that, that, that's going to come about anyway. It's not going to be just a function of allowing AI to, AIs to be treated as inventors. Thank you. Um, I've, there's been a couple of questions about the kind of philosophy and altruism versus business reality. And I think those are that's very helpful. Um, 
trying desperately to keep up with all the questions. I think we've covered off quite a few as we've gone. There's one I'd like to touch on, actually, which several people have mentioned and which we, we, we did mention briefly before, um, which is to do with the international aspect of this. Um, so the particular question actually is, uh, what's WIPO doing about this? Are they the right place to handle it? Um, so I'll start with that question, but then the broader question, um, if not them, then how are we going to arrive at something where at the moment we have a remarkably harmonized system really globally on patents. I know it's not perfect or totally harmonized, but the basics are very similar. We almost can't afford to have individual countries going off and doing their own thing uh, in the long term. Um, I'll start with you, Ryan. Do you know what WIPO is up to and what do you think about the international perspective? I, I have some vague ideas. We have some WIPO people in the audience. Um, and I first want to say I agree with everything Robin said as well, except I'm wondering where my American gold mine is, but perhaps we could discuss that <laughs> after. Um, you know, slow business coming up with a new international treaty to harmonize intellectual property amongst all the member states of the UN. So, you know, we'll get to work on that. I think in the meantime, the UK should just figure out what the right answer is and and come up with a policy that promotes the UK's industrial strategy and the right policy goals for the patent system. You know, there are already some unharmonized aspects. You know, for example, you can have different inventors in a US and a UK patent based on contribution to the claims or, you know, the heart of an invention that test is done differently in those jurisdictions. Um, but, you know, different jurisdictions, I think it's inevitable in the short term, have already come up with different rules for this. And, um, you know, applicants will have to make the best of this they can in the absence of something harmonized, relying on local counsel. Maybe there'll be different disclosures in different jurisdictions that could be still factually consistent with each other. Um, or maybe as you have with computer generated works and copyright, you can't get protection for that in the US, but you can in the UK. And that may drive businesses that are investing in sophisticated AI to make useful songs or, or use CGI in movies to, uh, to relocate to the UK. Thank you. The, the crossover with copyright has come up. I don't think we're going to have time to get onto that. We've got a minute or two left. First of all, note in the chat, everyone, that there's a, there's networking afterwards and just hanging out, which is which is lovely. Secondly, I'm going to do a plug for the wonderful award-winning podcast, Two IPs in a Pod. We'll shortly be interviewing WIPO, and we're going to add this to the list of questions for them because it'll be interesting to hear what they have to say. Um, maybe I can hand over to Nikki. I think you're going to get the last word, actually. Um, yeah, so the IPO has said in its consultations it is looking at the, uh, the international view. Ryan's exhorting you to go it alone. Um, what's, what's, what, we, what are you going to do about the, uh, the complex international situation? I think we recognise that uh, that people do have concerns about um, the, the the international arena, um, um, but I also hear what Brian says as well. I mean, I think we recognise that that sort of um, different sort of players are at different stages in terms of what what they think needs doing, if if needs doing at all, and we have to recognise that. Um, and maybe um, what we need to be looking at in terms of our consultation is getting views from folks like Karina, who spoke about, you know, we have different systems at the moment when it comes to inventorship, but are there sort of certain things that actually sort of certain key sort of principles that we could actually sort of take into account for the consultation, which actually would suggest that, you know, there wouldn't be harm for folks maybe in the future if other laws changed um that there would be certain fundamental principles that we could adopt that would sort of um cause maybe less harm than more um and would be keen to hear from folks on that thank you uh, let's keep to time so please everyone to check out the link in the chat about where to go next um can, BK... I, just say about, can I just say something about wonder.me Yes. This is the virtual uh, uh, cocktail party. It's not self-evident. You've never used it before. How it works? You will see a, a place with your a little a little round dot, which is you with your initials. If you want to move to somebody else, you you don't do what you might instinctively do and try and use your cursor to move it. You go to the place where you want to go and click on there, and your little person then move to that place. And you must unclick when you get there, or you'll go straight through it. But it's, a, it's quite fun. Thank you very much. That's the, the future <laughs> is about computers. We, that much is true. So the UK may or may not uh, lead the world, but it certainly is, I think, contributing hugely to keeping the debate going. Thanks so much to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, their names are up here. I won't name them for purposes of time. Um, thank you, but in particular, perhaps for, for 
Mr. Justice Beach is actually, we've seen day break in Australia. That's, that's such a wonderful commitment. Thank you so much. And everybody's input has been fantastic. This debate should continue. And of course, Abel, um, Sir Robin, you continue to provide these brilliant um, talking opportunities for everybody to just get through so many issues. And the, to the audience, apologies for the Q&As we didn't get to. Come to the chat afterwards and maybe you'll be able to catch a couple of people and get those questions in then. So I think I can probably hand over to you, Sir Robin, to finish. I just want to say one thing. I think this is the first time I've done, we've done something at Idle jointly with the Chartered Institute. It's not going to be the last. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks also to the IPO, actually, is a good point. Brilliant input from there. No, it, it's been wonderful to do. Thank you. Over to you, Robin. Close us off. Finish off with a flourish. Good night, all.